I don't think stress is good or bad. It just is. Mm -hmm. It's a natural reaction to what is in your environment. Lots of people have jobs where stress is just baked into what they do. Yeah. If we didn't have any stress in our lives, life would be completely boring. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Keynote Curators Podcast. I'm Seth Deckman, your Keynote Curator. I'm excited to welcome our guest, Eliz Green. Eliz, welcome to the podcast. It is such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Well, it's great to have you. I'm very excited for our conversation. Where does this podcast find you today? I am in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, which is where I am most of the time. Milwaukee, as we know from Wayne's <laughs> World, right? Right. And a very a resurgent NBA team, the Milwaukee Bucks. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, it is fun to see that kind of um, energy in our town. I just want to share a little bit with our viewers, you know, a little bit of your background, a little bit to, so that they're informed. And don't get stressed because this is Eliz's main focus. She's passionate about stress. She doesn't stress about stress, but she's passionate about it. She finds the body's chemical reactions to stress fascinating, intriguing. And her favorite topic to discuss anywhere, even in line at the grocery store. Having survived a heart attack at age 35, while seven months pregnant with twins, propelled Eliz to recognize stress management as a vital survival skill. And we share twins. I have twin 10-year-old daughters, Eliz. Oh, nice. Yes. Your personal journey, Eliz, I'm sharing this for our audience, is from enduring open heart surgery to holding your newborn daughters just days later, inspiring your mission to encourage others to prioritize their health. Today, she's dedicated to guiding others on a path to low stress and immense success. We can't underline that enough, right? Right. Low stress and immense success. It's a little bit alliterative. With nearly two decades of experience, Eliz shares practical research-backed strategies for managing stress and improving heart health, reaching thousands annually through your engaging presentations and writings. So once again, welcome. And I, I want you to give a little bit more color to the journey, pregnant, open heart surgery, holding your twins, and to where you are today, utilizing that hyper stressful moment as the platform, as the tool, as kind of the source of making a difference and impacting lives and training and educating people on how to have immense success. So uh, I love how you say immense success. I might have to change um, how I call it. I like that. You're right. It has a really nice alliterative uh, sound to it. One of the things that I think sets me apart from most people is I have a line in my life. I have the before times and the after times. Mm -hmm. and, and that line happened on November 12, 2000. I was in the hospital on bed rest because I was ginormously pregnant with twins. <laughs> and that's a medical term, ginormously pregnant. Yes. No. Uh, and, and I have to tell you, I, I, I laugh because I can relate my wife, you know, <laughs> I bet, you know, yeah, with I'll the bet. twins and my, and my wife is petite, right? She's not. Yeah. yeah. She, so she's I not am like very tall. I four on a good day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, similar. So, you know, there's no place for those babies to go. They just go out. So I was in preterm labor. I had been in the hospital for a month on bed rest already. We were getting to the point where things were going to be okay if, if my labor continued one of the, one of those days. And, you know, being on bed rest isn't easy. I don't know if your wife was on bed rest during the process. The, the last stages of it were, but certainly mm -hmm. not to the point of a hospital. You know, we, yeah. we, for our viewers who don't have twins, you know, Twins, I think technically they consider it high risk no matter what. So from yeah. the get-go, it is a high-risk pregnancy. Yeah. And at 35, I was a geriatric pre pregnancy. Isn't that a nice term? Yeah. <laughs> but because I'm a, a small person, I was in 
labor for three months, basically. And, you know, I time it. And if they were six minutes apart, we needed to do something about it. And if they weren't, I just sort of kept counting. And if I was well behaved and wasn't contracting too much, I got to get up and have a sitting down shower. And that was the only time really that I sat up. And that was like a five star spa at that point, right? It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, However, that morning, it was a Sunday morning, I started to have what I thought was heartburn. And I Mm. ate laying down. So I had heartburn all the time, but this Mm. quickly turned into something else. And by the time I combed out my hair and put it in a ponytail, this had become intense. Mm. I had all kinds of different things happening. I was feeling very fluttery and chilled. And I started to throw up for no reason. Mm. And I knew I was in trouble, rang for the nurse, and that's when everything started happening. As I said, I'd been there for a month. These are my friends. They came through the door and immediately knew that there was something wrong and action started. There were all kinds of people that came into my room, which was great because I fully coded. I did not breathe or my heart did not beat for 10 minutes, which is a long time. I know. Yeah. When I tell this to medical professionals, they're like, no, 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 no. That is not supposed to happen to pregnant women. Right. And you're standing Uh, here breathing and talking in front of you, right? Uh, I can still do fractions because I had great help right away. And they were able to figure out what was going on. They used a defibrillator to restart my heart. I had a catheterization to look at what was going on. I needed triple bypass surgery. Wow. And yeah, so they, um, I had a whole team that kind of followed me around at, in the hospital. They delivered our girls by emergency C section at 32 and a half weeks, which is pretty good. Not great. Right. For twins, good. I think my yes. girls were 35 and a half weeks. Yeah. yeah. So. so as soon as the girls were born, they started my open heart surgery. And I was very lucky. I had great physicians, great nurses, great care everywhere. The girls were, you know, just about seven weeks early or two months early, and they were little but big for how old they were. Right, right. And and I woke up from that experience knowing that I had been given this story for a reason, and I didn't mm. really know yeah. how I was supposed to use it, but opportunities started showing up for me. I spoke for the American Heart Association for their um, heart walk. I was the spokesperson for two years. That was a great way to sort of earn my chops as a speaker. Um, And then as the girls were getting older, I was sort of sad that they were going to go to school and I was going to go back to work. And I was sad to kind of leave behind that thing that I'd become so passionate about, about building awareness about women's and heart disease and giving people good strategies. And the Uh, executive director over there at the American Heart Association here in Milwaukee said, you know, people will pay you to do that. And I'm like, you're kidding. You're kidding. And sure enough, people would pay me to do it. And that is how I launched my career. I started out as a heart health speaker. I don't know if you're aware of it. Nobody gets excited about a keynote on heart health. Yeah. It's not exciting. No, it's not like, hey, let's, let's you know, like moths to light or ants on candy. Let's go run to that, right? But right. Correct, correct me where I'm wrong here. Heart disease in women, cardiac problems, I don't know how to phrase it. I want to get the widest scope, is uh, m- bigger, more prolific than breast cancer and mm-hmm. a couple of other very specific women's diseases. Is that accurate? Did I say, I said it, I kind of chopped it up. Absolutely. Yeah. It is absolutely the number one killer. It's the number one killer. That that's a way to say it. Right. More than breast cancer, more than cervical cancer, more than, more than any cancers, any diseases, like it is far ahead. And we've done a pretty good job of letting women know that this is, and men, everybody know that this is the case. But the problem is most women, when you ask them what's their biggest health concern, they don't list heart health as their first one. They're worried about breast cancer. And everybody should get their mammograms and do their self-exams. I'm not saying that's not important, but we need to take as much care of our heart as we do everything else. 
And yeah. fortunately, what we do for our heart makes everything else pretty good too. Yeah, and and that that's the public service announcement portion of our <laughs> our episode today. But really, because I have worked with the American Heart Association booking speakers, mm-hmm. I believe it's Red Hat is one of the programs. It's the among- Red Dress campaign. Red Dress campaign and and many other iterations of that program where we've brought speakers in, whether they mm-hmm. were former athletes that had uh, heart problems or heart attacks or heart surgery mm-hmm. or you know life altering medical interventions for their cardiac challenges, if you will. Mm-hmm. When you began to do the speaking, and then the director said that to you, what what was it apart from? the the fulfillment and you can share yeah. about that making a difference making an impact knowing that your message is touching people go a little bit deeper on that under the hood what was it that drew you to explore more of that as opposed to returning to a successful career well part of it was my successful career ahead of that was as a dance teacher and a choreographer and the time that I would be doing that job was when my kids would not be in school. So part of it was having something to earn money that allowed me to be with my kids as much as I wanted to, which speaking was a great opportunity to do that. But as I said, I felt called to this mission of raising awareness and educating people. And that morphed over time as I recognized Nobody really wants to talk about heart health and recognize how big of a role stress plays Mm. in heart health. It is one of the major risk factors for heart disease, but it is the most uh, under-treated. And it's not like you can put a cuff on your arm and pump it up and go, oh, I am 80% stress. I mean, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So we don't necessarily pay attention to it, but it can act as a powerball sort of multiplier of the risk that you already have. So that's when I started talking about stress more and more, and people kept asking for work-life balance programs and stress programs, that's when things started to accelerate. And I found that is where I can be the most helpful, providing no-nonsense, data-informed strategies for people to handle the stress they can't avoid. I I want to talk about your research and how it Mm -hmm. delves into purpose-driven organizations that can cultivate corporate culture that are resilient to overwhelm and uncertainty. And an important part Mm -hmm. of that cultural cultivation is stress-free leadership. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about that, about the strategies companies and leaders can implement to enhance performance and productivity and retain employees before we dive into that, and I, I really do want to hear about it on a, on a personal level and for our listeners, stress, I think the idea of it and how I'm, I'm speaking for the general public, how we relate to stress, the taboo and the stigma has been reduced and people are mm-hmm. more open to talk about it, more willing to look at it as a driver of bad health habits and bad performance and bad relationships and poor communication. And when we learn to use the research and turn the table on stress and govern it and administer it and dominate it, we can then see the impact that it has on our performance, on our relationships, on our ability to communicate, our happiness, our health and well-being and overall fulfillment. So this is something that you want to really keep an eye on. But do you Mm -hmm. agree that you see the stigma or the taboo? Because especially meeting planners and meeting professionals, Liz, it's a shield of honor. It's a badge of honor. Oh, you know, (laughs) I didn't sleep and I handled 19 tasks in 12 seconds and all these stressful things. But in the long run, even the short run, it's having a really negative impact. So Mm-hmm. There was a question, an editorial, an opinion, a comment, and a statement. <laughs> so I'm creating stress for you to answer something here. Go ahead and give it to us. You are really. Uh, here's the thing. I don't think stress is good or bad. It just is. Mm-hmm. It's a natural reaction to what is in your environment. And as you mentioned, meeting professionals in particular, they live in an environment of stress. Lots of people have jobs 
where stress is just baked into what they do. Yeah. I've had such opportunity through my research to jump in and have the opportunity to interview leaders in different organizations and then use my survey tool from the research project to really see what's causing stress in the environment. I absolutely love working with organizations where the stress is just baked in. We were talking before we started that you have a space shuttle behind you yes, um, I know. because you're at Kennedy Space Center. One of One of the organizations that I have had the pleasure to work with is NASA at Kennedy Space Center. The people who built, uh, assembled, and fired off humans into space. Stress is baked in. Yeah, baked into what they do. It's also part of what makes them go, right? If we didn't have any stress in our lives, life would be completely boring. Yeah, We need that little zing. And whenever our brains sense something stressful in our environment, things happen. You said at the beginning that I'm fascinated by this chemical reaction that happens in our body. So anytime there's a stressor in our environment, cortisol floods our body, all kinds of things start happening. Our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, our blood gets stickier. So if that thing in our environment is a potential car accident, Maybe you wouldn't bleed to death. Mm. All great, right? Yeah. The thing that I find fascinating is it is the exact same reaction to a potential car accident as it is to people jumping out and surprising you for your birthday. Same thing happens in your body. Your body doesn't know the difference between scary and surprising. It reacts the exact same way. The problem is if we live our lives like people are jumping out at us all the time, And the cortisol stays high. Nobody needs higher heart rate, stickier blood, or higher blood pressure. That's how stress impacts our hearts. Your body's naturally inclined to let that cortisol go when the stress leaves your environment. It comes back down. But for those of us who live in an environment of stress, you have to actively do something about it, which is how I often talk about stress management is active recovery from stress you can't avoid. You need to be able to disconnect from whatever is causing stress in your environment, allow your brain to recognize like, okay, we're done here, and signal your body to let all that cortisol out so you can recover from all of that stress. And I talk a lot of times about our baseline level. And on the cover of my book, there's a balloon and a vice. If you think about stress management, as that balloon. If your balloon is softly inflated, you can squeeze it. You can even sit on it and it's not going to pop. If it's highly inflated, that pops very easily. So the idea is how do you reduce that pressure on the inside so that you can deal with all of the pressure that comes from the outside? What what are some of the practical methods, you know, that you you say de-escalate or govern that? What do you suggest or recommend or what works for you or is, have you, you've seen that's worked? So there's two parts to it. One is the disconnection and one is signaling your body. So I'm going to start with the signaling your body because that's a little easier. Lots of the stress management strategies that people talk about do this, right? So yoga, meditation is all about breath work. Anytime we change our breath, it is a signal to our brain that something has changed and they can, your brain can let go of that cortisol. That's why yoga works. That's why meditation works. It's why laughter works. And it's also why singing works. So if you are singing in the car or the shower, you know, if what you got is loud and off key, go with it. It is a good stress management strategy. So anytime we can do that. That would be me, by the way, loud and off key. You know, Gen- cool. generally, generally flat, nasal, and monotonal. But you know, that's just you know, that's on the record too. Excellent, excellent. One of my favorite audience members told me the story that she has a walking into work playlist. So her commute was twenty five minutes. She had thirty minutes of music it, for her. It was all Beyonce. She sang at the top of her lungs all the way to work. Sat until the last song finished. Like got out. And slammed her door and just strutted into work. I'm thinking, what a great way to start your day, right? Singing is has been shown to 
elevate your mood. You've gotten rid of all your cortisol. You had a good time. You're walking in like ready to take on the world. What a great way to start. So that's a way to signal your body to let go. The disconnection though, it's very hard to let that go if it's constantly chewing at your brain. Right. And that's where a lot, a lot of us have trouble sleeping. Sleep is the most efficient way to get that cortisol out. Mm-hmm. But uncertainty is particularly bad here because it's not like another thing in your environment. It, it never goes away. It's just there. So it's the thing that sort of chews on your brain as you try to go to sleep or when you wake up in the middle of the night. It's like, hello, why don't we think about this for a while? And so the, the idea is how do we disconnect from that? And it is not one size fits all. Different people need different things in order to disconnect from that. A lot of the stress management stuff that we hear about is on the quiet contemplative side. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yoga, meditation, that sort of thing. That works for many people and it works really well. So I am not bashing yoga or meditation. I'm just saying there are some people, if you make them sit still and concentrate on their breathing, it makes them more stressed because they right. can't let go of this. I've heard they stories be- <laughs> of, of Wall Street, you know, very high stressful pressure jobs. They go to the Caribbean on vacation and they're just sitting on the beach and it's more stressful just sitting there doing nothing right. and they right. have heart attacks on vacation. It, well, and oftentimes when we're so hanging on so tight and we have the opportunity to let go, our bodies are like, what is going on? Yeah. And so you described these, these high stress Wall Street people. I mean, that's my husband. I'm really truly more on the on the contemplative side. My husband needs to be fully occupied in order to shut all of this mm-hmm. off. Right. So, you know, our vacations, like we can sit on the beach for a while, but he's going to need to go sail a boat or travel or, or yeah, yeah. I mean, he's yeah. going to need to do something, sightseeing, shopping, right. whatever Ride it is. Ride a bike. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So our, so in our family vernacular and how I talk about this is that my husband is a border collie <laughs> and I am an iguana. Like <laughs> I like to sit in the shade because I'm very pale and read my book and look at the water. That that my so th- this is the animal planet part of the episode here, right? Okay. Right. The idea is some of us are border collies and some of us are iguanas. Right. We all exist somewhere on that spectrum. If you know what you need, you can advocate it for when when you need that time. Our our vacations are very border collie active, but my husband will turn to me and say, "Hey, it's been a border collie day. Do you need some iguana time?" I'm like, mm. "Yes, I do." I can hang with the border collie, but I need that amount of time too. So finding that balance, knowing who on your team is a border collie and who's iguana, because if you're telling the border collie to just calm down and meditate, you are not helping. No go. Yeah. I, I love that analogy because it really just in the simplest way captures the, the energy, right? And there's not a one size fits all stresses. I like what you said earlier, stress just is, it can be negative, but it, there are, you know, just innumerable positive, positive aspects to it. It's part of our DNA, part of our evolution. Absolutely. But then when, when we are aware and we do bring a kind of a self-awareness or a consciousness to it, how do we govern it? How do we separate? And and then what do we do about it? And there are people too that are a little bit more of the iguana and a little bit border mm-hmm. collie. I think I'm a blend. I think I'm a fusion, yes. you know? That would be an iguana collie. Yeah, that, that we just and made history. We you came get up to with use this. all you No, know, it's in the book. Okay. <laughs> it's uh and and that's great because you get to use all of the strategies. In the book, there's a quiz and you can also find it online. I do have a resource page at stressproofnow.com. Everything there we'll is free. We'll include that in the we'll include yeah. that in the show notes for our listeners. But yes, the quiz and the quiz the is there. The book. Yep. With the quiz and in the book, there's a list of activities. So if you're an iguana, here's a list of activities that may help you disconnect. If you're an iguana collie, you get to use all, all of the activities. You just pick what you need at that particular moment. Yeah. And the way I look at it is we don't 
necessarily need to be stress-free, as we discussed. What we're really striving for is being stress-proof. How do you make sure that your baseline stays low enough that you can withstand all the things you can't control? Yeah. Where you're driving, it's not driving you. (laughs) Right. 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 And you use that zing of an impending deadline or, you know, there's that moment before the doors open at any event where you're like, hmm. and, you know, that's, that's good stress, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's exciting. That's what makes it right. fun. I get a little fluttery every time I go out on the stage. I would miss it if it wasn't there. And frankly, if I'm not a little zinged up, I'm probably not going to do my job very well. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I know in your, you're mm-hmm. currently in the throes of doing some very specific material based on your research for the event industry, event planners, event professionals, right. meeting professionals, albeit you're in the middle of it and it's not finished and not complete. You know, I know in the event industry, because you and I go to events all the time, mm-hmm. for me, and you know, it could be the case that it's other things, but for me, two topics tend to go hand in hand. How can event professionals who have one of the most stressful careers manage the stress and continue to thrive in their career? So there's the immense success, right? right. And having the tools and the capacity to understand the stress, govern it, and, you know, utilize it in a way that, you know, you can, you can thrive. Can, can you share a little bit about that and kind of what you're working sure. on Sure. Without, um, without giving it all away? Well, I am a big believer in giving everything away to the meeting industry because uh, we're all a part of it. And there was a group of meeting professionals that were part of my initial da- data set when I was looking at my job stress study. So I've known for a long time that meeting professionals are very stressed and they have very specific types of things that cause stress. Some of them are there all of the time. Some of them, when you get to an event, are just constantly bombarding, right? What I'm doing is putting together a very specific roadmap of how to deal with stress at an event. So we're going to talk some about how do we decrease that baseline stress as much as we possibly can so we're more resilient to whatever is going to come and bombard us. But giving very specific tools to deal with, for example, stress caused by other people, which is a big part of what happens at an event. Um, Whether it is the food service person who is suddenly coming and tell you that no lunch is not going to be Lunch is going to be 30 minutes late. Right, exactly. For, five, for 500 people. Right. And could you just stretch for 30 minutes? Sure. Of course we can. Or the attendee who comes with their phone and said, you know, it's complaining about how they can't make the event app work or the person who swears they registered already. Sounds um, like you've been to one or two events before. Maybe uh, and maybe have run some uh, yeah. as well. The So those things. It, how do we, it's really a roadmap of how do we reframe those interactions in a way that allows us to serve the people that we need to serve in the moment, de-escalate the emotion around it. Because what happens anytime we're faced with somebody who is stressed, angry, sad, whatever, our neurons want to mirror their neurons. So we start to have the same reaction in our body as they're having. That is how empathy works. But when your baseline's already high and you're probably an empathetic person to start with, now we're talking significant stress. Calming down your own stress reaction, dealing with the problem, and then making sure that we're not carrying that stress forward and adding to the pile, that roadmap is what I'm creating. That's, it, it, you know, I, I don't want to minimize it. It sounds like a cheat sheet or something. I think of it yeah. like as a... Yeah as a, like a reference card, you know, like the quarterback has the, the wristband with the plays on it, you know? Maybe it needs so, to be something you could stick in your name tag and just go, okay, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or the, I, I would imagine that there's things to, you know, your baseline at the beginning of the day, you know, wh- whether you're the iguana or the collie or, mm-hmm. or a mm-hmm. blend that there are, 
methods or things that you can do to, you know, right. begin to have a handle on, on, on what's going to come because they are going to come, those problems. Oh, they absolutely will. The only thing that is absolutely guaranteed is that something will go wrong. You know, we've had a lot of incredible guests, and I include you among that. One we recently had was Sunil Gupta. And, you know, he, he among many things, like, you know, a lot of different topic areas, you know, we, we talked a little bit about stress with him, and he recommended a 5-5 breathing technique. Mm -hmm. You know, we've also had some naturopaths on, John Ayo, and he recommends earthing after you travel. Are there any unconventional or out of the box kind of non-standard unexpected methods that you utilize for dealing with stress that you found particularly effective? So like I have a, about a bazillion running through my head. All right. Um, so so um, I will we'll, we'll do one. a seven series episode <laughs> to cover a bazillion <laughs> and that'll be a subscription based. That'll be a subscription based one. Absolutely. That sounds like a great plan. I think the the most out of the box one I have is cheering on your sport team. Okay. So if you are like me and are the type of fan who is likely to be vocal and on their feet, whether you're at the arena or in your living room, I like my girls when they were little would not sit near me when we were watching sports because mommy is loud. <laughs> I am an avid fan. Our biggest fandom right now is for the University of Wisconsin volleyball team. It's phenomenal. Volleyball is a great sport as a, as, as a spectator. I don't Lots have it on the moment. Lots of yeah. ups and downs. Oh, yeah. And it's just constant. I usually have my Apple watch on. So we had followed the University of Wisconsin volleyball team down to the national finals. Um, we did it this year, but the year in 2021, when they won the national competition, I was standing screaming, incredible volleyball going on. And my watch says, are you working out? And I'm like, so yes, <laughs> sure. because my heart rates up, my breath is changing. It is like the recipe to let cortisol go. Right. Mm. Every, I am not thinking about anything. It's not high potency activity. You know, I've done all of the things. And when I would sit it back down after the set was done, uh, you get that sort of ah uh, tingle feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cortisol leaving the body. And yeah. so, uh, you know, if you're cheering on your favorite team on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, whenever it happens, that's actually really good for you. Yeah. And embrace it. Embrace the activities yeah. that actually allow you to disconnect and recover. Yeah. And, and, and that full commitment to it displaces some of the noise, some of the swirls, mm -hmm. some of the other stressors that... Yep. While stress just is are having a negative impact on you and it, it occupies that gray matter with other activity that is, you know, cortisol reduction, that tingle feeling and yep. where you can kind of go to another place. I love that. So we'll include that with Sumo's <laughs> 555 and John Io's grounding root for your sports team as a, as, as access to stress management. That's great. You know, we're, we're also having a lot of guests on that are meeting professionals themselves, not just keynote speakers. Mm -hmm. And one of them that we recorded with recently was is Janice Cardinale. And she's, you know, a seasoned event expert and very focused on emotional well-being and emotional wellness, specifically to the event industry. And she recommended on incentive programs in particular that there's zero sessions, zero speakers. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be just feed them, wine them and dine them, but that, oh, I'm being brought into this incentive program. I have to go to this session. I have to go mm -hmm. see this speaker. I have to show up to this panel. H how do you, how do you see that? The, the way we framed it is that it's, the the incentive program is the vehicle for the rejuvenation mm -hmm. and, and for that, you know, recognition and the reward in and of itself on its own. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting strategy. And I get that most companies are like, well, we've got our high performance in one room. We should really pump them up to for sales next that's year. Right. I, like, I get that part. 
these are probably the people who do not need that pump up. They have figured out how to do it on their own. I would be a poor speaker if I said no speakers. Right. But I do think if your intention is to give them this respite, to give them what they need in order to perform by getting a break and doing all of that, thinking about what are you providing that does allow them to disconnect and gives them different tools to work with other than how we're going to meet, you know, this new sales quota. And, you know, there are wonderful entertainers who have that like message that slips in so nicely. I think that's the kind of programming that would be phenomenal. Plus, we, I think, are all a little out of practice relating to each other in larger numbers, that networking piece. Yeah. So strategically creating opportunities for people to interact and helping them do that in a way that allows them to make real connections is really important. It's why I am a big fan of having MCs at events who can make that happen yeah. in a room. Yeah. But also really thinking about these sort of in intentional incentive trips about how do you create a community within that group? Because it changes from year to year. How do you create that community so people are relaxed, people feel connected? I think that's really important too. Yeah, I that's really well said. And that that last piece about, you know, we've been out of practice connecting. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think it's it's the obvious is the pandemic and the post-pandemic People were on Zoom and, and doing hybrid events or virtual events, but also the world is changing so fast. It's like we have new skin every seven seconds instead of every seven <laughs> years. And there is that we have been here before, but it feels different. And now that it mm -hmm. feels different, it is different. You know, what worked then isn't going to work now. And let me retrain myself on people want different things. People want to get connected in a different way. So you know, that requires that, that, you know, that mindset and that, that, that way to handle the stressors, you know, especially as we touched on often comes from other people, you know, it reminds Absolutely. me of the phrase, you know, and I'm sure you've heard it, you know, where focus on what you can control. Oh, absolutely. You know, and absolutely. and not ruminate on, you know, I, I also very recently not ruminate on what you can't control. If, uh, if our life is 100, 95 of it's going well, we focus on the 5%, things like that, which I've seen yes. you cover in, in, your, in your wellness blog. We're almost at yes. the end here. I kind of want to round it off with one last thought or just a general thought from you. You know, you're, you have your wellness blog, you're a, you're a top mm -hmm. 10 online influencer on stress and heart health, and you served as a national spokesperson person for the American Heart Association. You're considered a heart disease expert on answers.com. You're also an author who writes a top health blog, as I mentioned. And if you're not busy enough as it is, <laughs> what is it that excites you right now that you're working on? Oh, well, uh, besides writing this fun thing for meeting professionals, the, the what roadmap. excites me? I just tried curling for the first time. And if mm -hmm. you're not familiar with curling, it happens on the ice. You yep. throw this stone sweeping. During the, the summer, I'm a big sailor. We have a 40-foot sailboat that mm -hmm. we race yeah. on Friday nights. I'm the race chair, so I handle all the analytics for the, the fleet. That makes me incredibly happy. In the dark times when we're not sailing, we have not had an activity, I think we have found it. It wow. has all of the, the qualities. There's lots of yummy data to crunch on it. It is active. It is something that you do with a group of people. It's just, I'm very excited about it. And it is, it is fascinating, you know, the physics of it where you can manipulate mm -hmm. a stone with the brushing Girl, yeah. and how it moves and spins and, and the talking and the communication. And, you know, it's on TV, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an international sport. That's really, really cool. Yeah. And you're sailing. Yeah. What is, so what is that, about a 13-meter boat? No, it is in meters. It would be 12-ish. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. 
I don't want to get um, on metric or English system, yeah. but you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a closet lover of sailing. Um, uh, well, come to Milwaukee, we'll take you out, but you, you know, you have to come during the season. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll do that. I will tell you that this is conversation has been really useful for me on getting I, new ideas on how to manage, relating myself as the iguana or the Kali, the border Kali, and maybe something in between. I feel like we've left a little bit on the table, as I always like to say, for you know the invitation to come back and see where your research is taking you. Before we completely finish up the episode, I'd like to get into um, a little bit of what we call 20 questions. It's technically not 20 questions, but it's the spirit okay. of... <laughs> It's the spirit of kind of a rapid fire response, a little bit of word association. So are you ready? I am ready. All right, here we go. What is the most interesting or unique thing about you that we wouldn't know by reading your resume or your bio? Oh, that's a good question. I can MacGyver a handle for anything out of whatever is on hand. That's, that is good. That is good to know. So that that's an added value as a keynote speaker in case the power goes <laughs> out or you know the microphone's not working. Well, we we will include that. Yeah. In the but, uh, yeah, I the, I have in the day bounced remote when they were like laser remotes, the <laughs> projectors back in the day, mirrors that were on the table on a mic stand to bounce into the machine. Yeah. There you I go. There's your there's your example of MacGyver in action. Five star beach resort holiday or camping up in the mountains on a lake or a river? Oh, beach holiday because more water. Gotcha. Ice cream, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Pizza, classic cheese or with toppings? Toppings. Social media, friend or foe? Ooh, a friendly foe. A friendly foe. I like that. I like the wordsmith that. What advice do you give your daughters for managing stress? Who? That's a, a really good question. They are 23, both have graduated from college and are in <laughs> and are employed. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay. My, my my cortisol just went down. I know. It's uh it's fantastic. I, I think what they have carried forward is that. They need to draw boundaries for themselves so they can take care of what they need to do to keep that baseline low so they can do a good job. That's great. Boundaries is so important. You know, mm -hmm. my daughters are younger than yours. And I think households today, again, social media with the rapidity, the the, the volume and the, and the velocity of life, um, we're all dealing with, I don't know if it's a full-blown anxiety, but some type of stressors that are feel new. We recall yeah. our childhood and it, gosh, it didn't look like this, you know, but that's the, because the, it's not like it was when we that's were. That's right. And I, but I um, think boundaries is a, is a through line and a common thread that um, over time, whether it's decades ago or not, uh, when I had hair, that, that is a mechanism, you know, to, to be able to govern and understand how to manage, manage that stress. Absolutely. If you could sail anywhere, knowing that you'd mm -hmm. arri arrive safely and return safely, where would it be? Ooh, mm, that's in New Zealand. What's your favorite style of dance? Oh, uh, lyrical jazz. Lyrical jazz. Well, I think that that is the perfect point to sign off and say goodbye with some lyrical jazz in the air. And everybody just can close their eyes and think about what that means for you. For me, it's a little, it's a little Miles Davis, it's a little Spyro Gyro, it's a little Chet Baker. You know, I think it's a blend. It's a little bit of iguana jazz with border collie jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. So Eliz, which is a very unique name, think of email, Eliz. Just thank you so much for the important work you do. Um, I'm looking forward to the roadmap that will be coming out soon. We're going to certainly share that with our community. For our listeners who have come back to continue to get these great curated insights, just thank you for your uh, loyalty. Thank you for being part of our tribe. For our new listeners, we appreciate you coming in and being a first timer. 
share it with your friends, uh, your neighbors, your colleagues, your family members, and you're smarter for having been here and shared it with us. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.